The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Yep. Sorry, I was saying welcome back. Welcome back, Dave. Thanks for coming back. Um, welcome back to part three of Naturalizing Sensemaking with Sensemaker in Residence, Dave Snowden. Uh, last session, Dave spoke about his evolving kidnapping framework for orienting action in organizational space. And I believe this session, he'll be discussing his adaptation of apex predator theory, if I'm right. Um, as usual, first, Dave is going to present some content that he prepared, uh, during which time I encourage you to post your questions in the chat. Um, this will be recorded and posted to YouTube. So. Um, if you would like me to ask your question on your behalf, just indicate so with your question. And uh, without further ado, I would like to pass it over to Dave. Okay, so um, first of all, apologies for last week having to be cancelled. Everything got a bit difficult at the last minute. And I'm now in a cottage in the middle of the Lake District um, on a walk-in holiday. So. Um, yeah, I'm hoping the internet will stand up. It's been okay so far, um, but I'm having to change to the iPhone on 3G, so um, we'll, we'll, it, it looks okay. Um, what I want to do is to go through Apex Predator Theory. I'm not sure this is the right name for it. I coined it some time ago um, because my initial focus was literally on the Apex, um, and I'll define that in a minute. But I'm now getting much more interested as well in things like keystone species and other aspects of trophic cascades. So this is a, a framework looking for a name at the moment. It may stay as apex, but it tends to focus people on dominating the space um, rather than, for example, enabling the space. So I'll, I'll run through that. If I get a chance, I'm going to introduce the concept of um, rich data as well to go with big data and thick data, because I'd like to leave you to something to think about before we come into that next week, which is the fourth week and the final week. So this stuff actually goes back before Kinevin. Um, it's when I was working in corporate strategy. And one of the key books I read at that time um, was a book called Crossing the Chasm, um, which I still recommend. And I don't recommend many popular management books. I generally think they're a load of bloody rubbish, but this one kind of like worked. Yeah? Partly because he made some predictions which came true, which is always impressive. Most management books are heavily retrospective. Um, and what, what he did was to take the basic concept of a life cycle, and that's normally drawn as like a big curve. And within that curve, you have different groups. You have early adopters, you have early majority, late majority, laggards, and so on. Um, now that's been around for a long time. It goes back to Procter and Gamble, and there are well-established statistics, and there's some broad principles. Um, if you move into the early majority phase, then you can command total market share. Uh, if the dominant market player at the end of that, you control the latter stages of the life cycle of a product, and so on. So there was a body of theory he built on. Um, but what he critically said is that there is actually this thing called a chasm. So you get these, and there's various names on this, and I'm still playing with them, but you get people who, you know, the guys who always buy something new. Doesn't matter what it is, they've got to have the new thing. Uh, they're the ones who queue up outside the Apple store rather than wait 24 hours, you know, and get some sleep. Um, and these people are vital to the launch of new products. And the key thing to understand about this group um, is that they want to know how it does it. They're not so interested in what it does. And this is a critical distinction. So they're the guys who want the latest car because they don't believe cars are to drive around. They think cars are to take apart and put back together on the weekend. They like to get involved and dirty. Um, and that's normally where you say something new that these guys want something, they're prepared to accept failure. In fact, they quite like failure because then they can get involved in helping you fix it. Um, and most products start there. And if they succeed, then people will draw projection growth you know, on the traditional life cycle curve and assume it will carry on, carry on going. What more established is that actually that isn't the case. You get this sudden drop 
So everything is going fine. And all of a sudden you don't get any sales for a bit. And that's the chasm between these early enthusiasts and the early majority. And the key behavioral difference is the first group are buying uh, what it does. And the second group are buying, sorry, the first group are buying how it does it. And the second group are buying what it will do for me. Now, critically, they don't want to know what it will do for other people because they want first mover advantage. This is why this is a key phase. So the early group, that is about two and a half percent of the total markets, and I'll class them as early adopters for the moment because that's the phrase I use. It's not strictly what Moore does. But the early adopters, they, they love novelty, they love new things. I remember when we were building new software based on um, stock forecast, forecasting and inventory management algorithms working with Cranfield University, uh, doing something which actually I'm bringing back in now because everybody's forgotten about variable buffer stock as a way of handling uncertainty. And you can do that in crisis management as well. Uh, it comes from a sort of the operational research background. So we were introducing new software on that and we got the classic early adopters. So we got Coca-Cola, um, we got British Aerospace, we got NATO. If, if you're selling to early adopters, there's no industry specialization at all. These are the people in their industry who like to do things new and they can afford to waste some money because they like to grab them first. Yeah? And I still remember we did a big seminar out at um, NAMSA, which is the supply division of NATO. And the bastards were actually making deliberate mistakes in algorithms to see if we spotted them when they were discussing what we did on the board. And then they told us how we could have done it much better if only, only we'd listened to them. This is the other characteristic of early adopters. If you want to sell to them, they can always tell you how they would have done it better. The fact nobody is prepared to fund them, they kind of like conveniently forget. You know? I should say the whole of the software industry is a bit like this. Show any software to any software programmer and they'll tell you you chose the wrong language rather than actually thinking about it. So these are a right bloody pain, to be honest. And then you hit the chasm and everybody's expecting ongoing sales. Um, the early adopter, the, the early majority phase on the other hand, which is about 13.5% of the total market, these guys aren't concerned about how it does it. They want to know that you've done it. They're not going to do it for the first time. But then they want to know what it will do for them and what the risk is. Yeah, they want first mover advantage. They don't want to be second movers, but they don't want to be bleeding edge to use the sort of convention. And an awful lot of companies never make the switch. You know, they, they start off and startup companies are hugely enthusiastic about how they do things and their wonderful algorithms and their brilliant ideas. And they just want to keep telling you that. It's kind of you know, the feature stuff. Um, and they don't realize when the market switches to benefits. And that's another driver yeah, on the chasm, i.e. that the, the sales behavior doesn't work. So we did a big piece of work on that. It was part of the Genus program in data sciences, which turned us around from a penny a share to about, I think, 40 pounds a share in 18 months when IBM bought us. Um, and it was basically, we sat down one day, um, and I remember sitting there with the whiteboard and saying, guys, we can't go through this. We've got to get new products to market and we can't go through this phase. So we've got to cross the chasm. We've got to jump across the chasm. And that's what I started to specialize in. And that was what got me, one of the things which got me into the strategy roles in IBM and elsewhere was that basic concept. And the way we did it at that time is we were world leading experts on something nobody wanted to buy, which is, you know, kind of like immensely self-satisfying, but not good for the business. You know? So we were experts in what was called then RAD and JAD. Um, it had been invented by IBM, Rapid Application Development, Joint Application Design, invented by IBM in Canada, forgotten. Um, we were picking it up and using it a lot. It was kind of like early stage Agile. This comes way before Agile, um, although it's one of the feeders. So we were really good at that. But the trouble is it was entirely novel and nobody wanted to buy it. Yeah. The other thing we were really good at was object-oriented programming and object libraries. In fact, we were pioneering the use of object libraries to get reuse code. The way to do that, by the way, is not allow programmers access to source code. If they ever see source code, they want to reinvent it. You, know, you have to force them through some of the gate on that. But either way, we're world experts in these things. We did defense contracts, which were magnificent. The trouble is we couldn't get to commercial markets. 
Now, what I then did was to say, okay, so what's the big thing everybody's got budgets for at the moment? Um, and where there's no question they've got to buy and effectively you've got a seller's market. If you've got a seller's market, you can get away with damn sight more than the buyer's market. And at that time, it was legacy system management. You may remember this is in the build-up to the year 2000. And I still remember, remember removing Coble and Fortran from my CV in 1995, because I didn't want anybody to know I could code in that, because I knew what would happen yeah, in a few years' time. Um, so everybody was buying legacy system management. We had no history in that. But the market leader in Europe was a company called Unilog. Um, so I got in touch. We had some meetings. We had a slight bond there and the director responsible was for Breton. Yeah, and if you don't know it, Breton is the same as Welsh. So we could chat in Welsh and nobody, neither of our two boards knew what the hell we were doing. And if you know anything about companies in France, you'll know that for a Breton to become a director of a company otherwise run by Grand Ecoles from Paris, it's kind of like this guy was bright, right? So they were market leaders in Europe. So we basically took their method on intact as European distributors. So we had Les Methodes Francais, which always goes down within, in, with English speaking audiences as well. Um, and what we did is we differentiated it with RAD, JAD and object orientation. So we said, we can object encapsulate your legacy code so you can reuse it in modern software. And we've got RAD, JAD techniques, which means we can rapidly work out what you really need to do and get you better focus. And that was maybe 2% of a bid. I don't think we ever did object encapsulation, by the way, but everybody thought it was a cute idea. Uh, what it meant is they bought us because we could do the conventional stuff and we had credibility. That's a late majority market. Yeah, they were buying our reference sites, all of which were France or Germany with Ponchka as well. But we had this interest in little thing, which IT departments got mildly excited about. So they kind of like preferred to have us than one of the big consultancy firms because they could get exactly what the big consultancy firm was doing with these extra things as well. Um, within about a year, those were dominating our sales because as they started to use Rad and Jad, they suddenly realized the effectiveness of it. So they commissioned us to do more and that was a turnaround of the company. And that is called a symbiotic marketing strategy. Yeah, and kind of like, it's something I'm paranoid about. You should never try and sell on the left-hand side of the chasm. Yeah, the secret to success is to bring something in on the right-hand side. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about next week is how do you repurpose existing capability to match unarticulated needs? Um, because that's where you really gain advantage and there's a whole science behind how you do that. Yeah, it comes from the weak signal detection work we did in DARPA. So that was kind of like successful. That got me into market life cycle. And then as I moved into IBM research and then left IBM research and set up data cognitive edge, this stuff started to come in because we were introducing SenseMaker, which at that time was a complete unique, nobody had ever thought of a quantitative approach to narrative before, uh, let alone an approach based on epistemic justice principles, namely allowing people to interpret their own narratives. Um, so we started to look at that um, and then I started to see a broader pattern in this. And complexity theory was coming in with its emphasis on context. And so what I did was I took Moore's concept of crossing the chasm. And I also took, took S curves, which I first came across in Charles Handy, um, um, but actually predate that in economics. And what I did was to combine the two. Now at this point, I'm gonna share a screen. I think I finished with a cat last time. So that is definitely a predator. Um, so what I did was to combine the two. So I took an S curve and took it down a bit and I took the market life cycle curve and introduced the chasm. Right, so hopefully you can see that. It's kind of like you know, there's an S curve like that. There's this bigger sort of market life cycle but with a drop in the middle. So basically something takes off, it's completely novel then it goes into the chasm, then it becomes dominant, and then it moves on. So this is a combination of S-curves and, and life cycle theory per um, more. So that's cool, but the big realization I had was that actually, 
the previous cycle is one of the reasons for the chasm. So let me run through this with my favorite example. So one of the reasons that the completely novel idea is ready for penetration, people are prepared to buy it, is because the old idea or the old product is starting to run out of utility or is becoming a commodity. So that creates a space for something new. But because it's at the end of the life cycle, you know, the buyers are conservative buyers, so nobody wants to buy the new stuff. And that's the reason you get depressed sales after you've sucked up the 2.5% of the Lord by something new anyway. So effectively, the dominance of the previous idea starts to explain the reason for the suppression of novelty in the chasm. Now, one of the examples I normally give on this is to look at IBM's total dominance of computing uh, from really the 70s through the 80s into the 90s. And the reason IBM was able to do that is that they repurposed. If you remember that word acceptation from the first of these lectures, what they did is they were, were, had worldwide competence in punch cards from various manufacturing machine control devices. So they repurposed that competence to create the first ever programs, which were all card based for those of us who are old enough to remember it. Yeah? If you learn to program on punch cards, you have real programming discipline. Yeah? Um, you also learn to carry things carefully. There's a few lessons you get from punch cards. So basically, because they already knew how to do punch cards and they'd been through all the grief, they were highly competent in that. That gave them first mover advantage and then they controlled the IT industry. I mean, they had the worst hardware and the worst software. Um, things like, you know, the DEC Alpha were infinitely better when the IBM PC, when they came out, and a VAX cluster could outperform an AS400. Sorry, I'm showing my age now. Um, but basically, people didn't buy the best thing, they bought the safest thing. Now, that's actually quite important to remember. So as you move into maturer markets, people want to buy what other people have bought. There was a phrase then, nobody gets fired for buying IBM. So buy something novel and different and it goes wrong, it will all be your fault. Buy IBM and it goes wrong, it won't be your fault because everybody else made the same mistake. McKinsey's are playing off this hugely at the moment in the consultancy market. Um, it's kind of like there are infinitely, certainly in an agile, virtually any agile consultancy is a lot better than McKinsey's in doing the job. But you're not going to get fired if you hire McKinsey's um, because of their reputation. Yeah? And remember that this is a conservative buying pattern. Now, because of that, so IBM gets first mover advantage, it pulls out of the chasm, it dominates that early adopter phase, which means it controls the late adopter markets, which is where all the revenue is. Yeah. Um, I'm going to tell you something depressing about politics on this at the end, because it applies there as well. But let's keep the commercial for the moment. Now, the trouble is that once something reaches its late majority phase, it's starting to become a commodity. And as it starts to become a commodity, other players can produce things quicker and cheaper. But the trouble is, if you're the apex predator, the top of the supply chain, you don't see it because your price is protected for a very long time. So the shock when it hits you is almost catastrophic. You might remember IBM at that time was the largest ever corporate loss in world history. And um, it's been far exceeded since but it was kind of like a major first. So basically, because they're a commodity, they don't see the price drops come in, they, start, they don't realize what's gonna happen. And we got a completely new apex predator in the IT industry, a little software company called Microsoft, um, which had actually been paid by IBM to develop an operating system, which they quasi stole from somebody else anyway. And IBM didn't think software was significant, it was all about hardware. Um, so they let Bill have the IP rights to it. And lo and behold, you've got an Apex Predator. Now this Apex Predator concept is key because the entire ecosystem organizes around it. Uh, there's a video it's worth looking at. If you type Trophic Cascade Walls in Yellowstone into Google, um, you'll find a wonderful little video which shows what happened when they reintroduced walls into Yellowstone. Because they were the Apex Predator with wolves, yeah, deer were culled, deer didn't graze riverbanks because they were afraid of wolves, um, water ran clear. Uh, so basically, the apex predator survives no matter how incompetent they are, 
because the ecosystem self-organizes around them. And of course, when the ecosystem is destroyed, the apex predator can no longer survive, so a new one comes through. When the meteor wipes out the dinosaurs, yeah, if you had to guess on the successor, you'd go for the crocodile or the shark. You wouldn't go for the first mammal. But actually, something very small and very energy efficient is more likely to come through this stage. Yeah, so that's the, the apex predator concept. And once they're established, you get a trophic cascade and the rest of the ecosystem organizes around them. So again, they survive even if they're incompetent, yeah, until the ecosystem itself is disrupted. So the hardware to software shift was a massive ecosystem disruption triggered by commodification. And then the same thing happens again. So Microsoft dominate the space. They can command whatever money they want. Everybody has to buy Windows, despite the fact it's appalling software. Sorry, I'm a Mac boy. Um, yeah, it's, and don't talk about Word and PowerPoint, for God's sake, right? Um, so, but everybody buys it because it's a safe purchase, but it becomes a commodity. You start to get free software, you start to get the open source movement. And Microsoft doesn't realize that until it's too late. I mean, it's reinventing itself as a completely different company at the moment. Just like IBM reinvented itself as a services company, not a hardware company. Yeah, so kind of like if you've got a lot of cash, you can do that. A lot of companies go under. Uh, the entire European computer industry went under, by the way, at the same time as IBM did, just disappeared um, because it was working in a commodity market. And of course, when Microsoft realized that, they suddenly discovered that Apple have overtaken them because Apple realized that the ecosystem was about integrated hardware and software. People weren't concerned about the hardware or the software. They were concerned about having something beautiful, which did something they didn't know they wanted until they had it. And then they couldn't do without it. That was Apple's initial success. And we'll go through this cycle again. Um, I think this one will be longer because Apple had taken an ecosystem route rather than, rather than a product route. Yeah, so they may be able to sustain it longer, but this is a natural cycle. Um, you will also see the cycle in politics. So if you go back some, what neoliberalism did was it homogenized politics. Yeah, it actually meant both Republicans and Democrats or Labour and Conservative were all competing from the centre ground. They all accepted neoliberalism, so there was no difference between the major political parties or people didn't see a difference. Again, that's the commodification phase. That means the energy cost of a completely new predator coming into the ecosystem goes radically down. So when you lose strategic diversity and you get homogenization, something new can come in as Trump did or as the far right and the Conservative Party did in the UK at very low energy cost because the system is ready for that type of radical disruption. So this, this framework has a, a wider um, purpose. Yeah. Um, now, if we then look at it in more detail, you've actually got this period, if I can get this to advance, which I currently can't. Okay, you get this period here um, where basically if you're the dominant predator at the moment, you're now hitting this particular point, this particular point here, which I call the exactive point. Um, that's where you should realize that you're reaching the peak of your overall market dominance. You're starting to see novel competitors you're not having a problem competing with them, you can wipe them out, but there's an increasing number of them and some of them are starting to gain traction. That's where you need to make a radical shift in your business. If you don't do it, you reach this point, um, which is called competence-induced failure. Yeah. This is the point, and this goes back to Clayton Christensen's work, and I did some work with Clayton Christensen on one project, product, and we talked a lot about this then. Um, because this puts context on what he says. As Christian pointed out, companies don't fail because they're incompetent. They fail because they're too competent at the old paradigm. So people can't see that actually the old paradigm doesn't work anymore. Yeah, you can see that, for example, in Hillary Clinton's campaign in the last American presidential election. I can give you lots of other examples. Yeah? The old frameworks aren't working anymore. 
um, but they're the dominant way of thinking. So you effectively have this very narrow gap here um, where you can make an adjustment. Now, there is important things which come out of this. Um, the first is, if you actually look at nearly all industries, all political systems, all social systems seem to go through this cycle. The work I'm building into this at the moment is not just to look at the apex predator, but also to look at keystone species, things like beavers. And I'd argue that in IT, for a long time, Intel went down a keystone species model. It may have been the apex in microchips, but in overall computing, its chips were used by everybody. It was kind of like the supplier of choice. Apple went in and out and so on. So a keystone species is something which sustains the ecosystem but doesn't dominate it. An apex predator dominates the system and we can go on and add some more metaphors in this as we go. Um, but the principle of this framework, and it's, to my mind, is up there with Kinevin as a sense-making framework, although it's about five to six years behind in development. Yeah. It basically says that in different contexts, different things are possible. So if you're in, if you come out of that early adopter phase, um, and that ends at the competence-induced failure point, that's the 13.5%, if you're not in total, if you're not actually dominating the market at that point, somebody else is, and you'll lose the rest of the business. Now at that point, your strategy, um, and I'm sorry to carry on with these African metaphors, is a hyena strategy. You have to feed off the scraps of the dominant predator. So you have to become, for example, a Microsoft certified supplier. Or if you're in Agile at the moment, and by the way, Agile is way past the stage in heavy commodification at the moment, uh, you end up having to be a safe certified consultant, which is to my mind, a form of controlled and certified insanity, but that's another matter, right? Basically, you've got an apex predator, you have to serve the apex predator because you can't compete with it. There's very little room for competition. But when the apex predator starts to become highly commodified, and you can see this, by the way, with design thinking, as well as with Agile at the moment, yeah, they're both going through heavy commodification phrases. That's when you introduce something new. And if you've got any sense, you introduce something new by this exaptive turn, by taking something you're competent at and applying it to something completely novel. I'm going to talk a bit next week about how you can manage for serendipity, which is another way of describing that. Yeah. So context is everything. Yeah. If you're in the growth phase, and you can look at this in terms of organizational change. So if your company has got a new CEO and a new H director, and they've fallen in love with some consultants over the model, you're not going to be able to shake it until it starts to fail or until it becomes so commodified and commonplace, it no longer adds value. So there's no point in fighting it then, you have to wait your moment. You have to wait for the commodification point to introduce something new, All right? Now again, this is important because if you look at most of the post-porter type strategy approaches which come out of systems thinking and cybernetics, they assume that strategy is not context specific. They have the same models and the same templates that you apply wherever you are. What Apex Predator says, very like Kinevin, yeah, and by the way, I can map this to Kinevin. Yeah, I've got a chaotic point, I've got a complex point, I've got an ordered point. What Apex Predator says is, first of all, what context are you in? That tells you what's possible. Yeah, and it tells you where the energy gradients are, coming back to what I said in the first lecture. You need to go where you have the lowest energy gradient, the easiest form of action. So that in a high level, yeah, um, is apex predator theory. Now linked to this, and this comes into the work we did on counterterrorism. So there were two things I was tasked to do uh, when I took this contract on, and this was years back, it was before 9-11. Um, so I got summoned down to Washington and met a really nice old man and we had a great conversation. And after I decided that I really liked him, I saw a picture of him with Ronald Reagan and discovered I was talking with Admiral John Poindexter, who you might remember was Reagan's NSA at the time of the Iran-Contra affair, but I'm sorry I will defend him, he's still a friend. Um, and I ended up working for him on DARPA projects for about a decade. And we had a series of tasks. One was the weak signal detection task. 
So how do you identify an outlier? Remember the 17% from the first lecture? How do I identify people who've seen a gorilla but nobody is listening to? Right? So that was kind of like task number one. Um, task number two, and I'll never forget when he said this, he said when he was NSA, when he asked for advice, people competed not to tell him the truth, but to have their advice accepted. The more senior you are in government or industry, the more people compete to tell you what you want to hear. Um, because that's how they survive. Yeah? Um, and what he wanted was disintermediation, a system by which he could look at the entire landscape and go direct to raw intelligence reports without any mediation or interpretation. And that I'm going to talk a bit about the next week as well. And the third thing um, he was looking at, and this is something we can have a discussion like completely next week. He said how, and he didn't phrase it like this, but Max Brasser and I were with him. And, and I remember we both said, you want us to reverse Ashby's law then do. Now remember Ashby's law from the early days of information science says that only variety can match variety. So as you get increasing levels of data stimulation, you have to increasingly pump up the energy level of your response. And you kind of like go up this line to the point where you end up with aircraft security in the days when we used to fly around the world, right? Only a year ago now, come to think of it. Um, where they actually, the cost of preventing failure is out of all proportion to the benefit. And that's what's called asymmetric warfare. What the terrorist is doing is making your cost of defending against them so high that you will concede. Now, the stuff Max and I did with John was to actually look at how do you reverse Ashby's law by using human sensor networks. So how do governments become asymmetric powers, not symmetric powers? And that actually feeds into new forms of democracy. So I'll probably pick up that next week. Um, but part of that is this apex theory. Is it basically says in different contexts, the energy gradient of change is very low in other contexts, the energy gradient of change is high. If you're not aware of it, then you'll be destroyed. And we saw that with neoliberal economics. Yeah? Um, we've seen it with IBM. We've seen it with Microsoft. We will see it with Apple. Um, we've seen it, we're seeing it at the moment with design thinking. We're definitely seeing it with Agile. This is kind of like a standard cycle. If you're aware of it, you can hit the renewal button before it's too late. Because you may notice under competence induced failure, that line just goes on down, yeah, and you actually disappear. Now, key to all of those three point Dexter questions, which I raised, and this is where I'm going to introduce something and then really go into this next week, is this. Right? Now, I extracted the top picture from uh, Trisha Wang, um, who blogs on this. You can find the reference, yeah. Um, I'm paranoid about acknowledging sources. I get really upset when some people don't. And she produced the top model, which compared big data with thick data. Um, she's an ethnographer. This is becoming a very fashionable thing for people with an ethnographic training. So she said, big data, yeah, has very large volume data sets. And it gains insight from that through algorithmic interpretation. Um, but the depth of the insight, she said, is shallow. She then contrasts that with an ethnographer who is dealing with low volumes of data, but high volumes of meaning. And that she called thick data. Right? And she basically says you need thick data to complement big data. Now, I remember looking at this and saying, well, there's a lot of white space on that. Um, big data actually increases meaning as you get more and more data. So she's got that wrong. It's not a column. Yeah, it, it will actually, as you get huge volumes, yeah, you start to actually get high levels of meaning. But thick data doesn't scale. So the work we focused on, which I'll go through next week, and this is called SenseMaker, which is a primary sense making tool, is, and this links in with the human sensor networks is by allowing people to self-interpret their own experience on a continuous basis into a quantitative framework, you can get the benefits of scale with the richness of human interpretation. Yeah. Now, I'm going to just spend a couple more minutes on that because I want this one to hang around in your minds for a bit. I'm ready for next week. 
So what we're seeking to do is increase the human interpretation within the system. Now, there are also defensive reasons for that. So at the moment, the internet, particularly social media, is an unbuffered feedback loop. Right? So if you look at what happens, particularly in the current political climate, you've got whole bot farms, yeah, you've got individual malicious actors, the system has no buffering in it, and any unbuffered feedback loop always leads to perverse outcomes. You might remember computer trading algorithms, um, computer trading algorithms which almost destroyed the economy yeah, because they went into an, into a, into an unbuffered feedback loop. Yeah, there's no control. So what we're doing is to use citizens, including school children, activists, ordinary citizens, nurses, doctors, people in their day-to-day -day roles, um, effectively as self-ethnographers to their own day-to-day -to -day experiences and shifting the power of interpretation from the expert in the algorithm to the individual responsible for the data, but in a quantitative way. And I'll say I'll talk about how we do this next week. But the principle is to get very rich data and in real time to be able to stimulate that network to give feedback for distributed decision support. Now that is gonna be the big theme of next week is how do you distribute decision support? Yeah, because you need cognitively, culturally, educationally diverse groups. Otherwise you'll miss the 17%. And it's also linked in with the issue of power because at the moment, um, if you look at the way democracy doesn't work, yeah, it's the tyranny of the person with the most money to create the most algorithms, to run the most adverts. People's ordinary wishes don't show through, show through. And you see this also in consumer spending and everything else. So this ability to understand not just raw content, but also how people interpret that content becomes key. Right? So that's... And I remember I was thinking about Trump when I wrote the blog post. So I wrote, I, the blog post is called Big, Thick and Rich, right? So you can take it from there. Um, but the idea is all three types of data are important, but the rich data is probably the most important because it's the most responsive to change. And it's important to remember that algorithms are entirely based on training data sets. They cope with novelty less well than humans. And ethnographers are entirely based on which particular school they were trained in. So neither is, is free, of, free of, of significant bias. Yeah? You never get rid of bias overall, but you should try and reduce significant bias. Now, what that is also going to give us is a means of triggering an alert when we reach an exaptive moment. And I'm trailing next week now. That's called an anticipatory trigger. Because human beings are very good at noticing an anomaly if you tell them there is an anomaly, but they're hopeless if you don't. So you may remember as kids, all right, you've got these pictures of line drawings of a park. And the question would be how many kitchen utensils are hidden in the park? And because you knew there was something hidden in the park, you could see them and spot them. But if you weren't told, you would never see them. So anticipatory triggers are designed to bring human beings to pay attention to weak signals before they become dominant circles so they can recognize those shifts within the apex curves or you know, more simple things like competitive or industrial threat or whatever. So that's high level. Yeah, and as I say, this framework sort of sits alongside Kinevin and the stuff I'm introducing now on big thick on rich data is kind of like the third um, leg of the stool. You know, Kinevin as a primary sense making framework, apex predator theory as a means of determining where you are, and the whole issue of distributed narrative sense making um, as a new method of research, insight, and decision support. So those are the three things I'll cover over the time. And I've taken my 40 minutes, I think. Yes, I have. So open to questions. Thanks, Dave. That was great. Um, personally, I'm really excited for next week. I was excited about this topic from day one, so I'm really looking forward to next week. Um, so we have a couple questions. Maybe I'll give someone a chance to ask before I do. Um, so first we have, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but Titia, Titia, you have a question you'd like to ask, Dave? 
Uh, yes, yes, it's Tizia, so you pronounce it all right. So my question is um, on these two curves, uh, between this acceptive point and competence-induced competence failure, is that also the point where you see companies annexing or buying that novel player? Yeah, I think, and that's one strategy, but it only works for so long, um, and that's if they see it. Um, you generally find they often buy too late. I mean, it's been quite interesting in Agile, the big six have been buying up Agile companies at ridiculous P ratios. They're actually not buying the company, they're buying the brand. And those prices are no longer on offer. So people have got more sophisticated about recovery strategies, yeah? If you've got a lot of cash, um, but generally towards the right-hand side of that yellow space, people start to realize it's not working and they panic. The sooner you realize you're at that moment, the less panic you have to do. Yeah. Um, okay, and next we have Tony. Tony, you had a question you'd like to ask? Well, it, it really wasn't a question necessarily, but it was a, the, the comment was uh, the work that you did with uh, Dave, uh, with, excuse me, no. Uh, with um, Poindexter about disintermediation of, of raw data. That's sort of what got us into the Iraq war because Cheney, the vice president at the time, loved to look at the raw intelligence reports and, and draw his own conclusions, which may or may not have been informed by any kind of context or, or the context that he wanted to read into them. That was my only comment. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I was around at that time, all right. Um, spent all my time in DC. The fact is that one agent can't read all the reports. That's the danger. So what actually happened is you read the ones which match what you want to hear. So Poindexter could have done that anytime. What he wanted is something which visualized all of the available intelligence so he could see patterns. And that would focus him on reading things he needed to read. And that's a radical difference. Yeah. And that was what we did. I okay. did have an entertaining time in the Pentagon by quoting Roman doctrine on military doctrine on invading Syria. Um, but, and the Romans had it worked out. They said, if you have a rebellion in, in the Parthians, right, which is the same area, um, because they were fighting Iraq then as well, you know, move in with overwhelming force and wait outside the capital city and let the factions fight each out, uh, each, it out and then move in and support the winning faction. If you move in and conquer the city, all the factions will unite against you and you won't achieve your results. And I remember saying that, and I still stand by that as advice. That, that's sort of like when the English show up, you're Welsh. Yeah, and I mean, the, the English, I mean, they practiced on the Welsh. Every time they invaded us, they had more Welsh troops fighting for them than English troops. And that's how they conquered India. They did it by exploiting local differences in the people they were conquering. It was, and it was a very successful strategy. Yeah. Yet you guys wanted to make everybody American. That never worked. Okay, great. Um, I have a question with a couple plus ones. Um, it was an anonymous question. I will ask it for the person. Um, if the ecosystem shifts towards an experience economy, what do the apex predator and keystone species look like? Did you understand the question? I think that's interesting. I mean, it, it's part of the problem we addressed in the early days of knowledge management, where companies were starting to hire in people. So the idea then was, you no longer have lifetime employment, you're expected to move on every two to three years. Um, and then it was held this would be a benefit to you. The reality, it meant that you just rented your knowledge. You only contributed what you really needed to contribute. And for me, a lot of the experienced economy is no different from the gig economy. Yeah? Um, because the danger is you have to actually, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's the issue about what people will do for you. Are you paying them to do something yeah, which you know you want? Or are they part of your inner ecosystem and they're part of generating novelty and new ideas you didn't know you needed? 
Um, and also the nature of experience is also critical to understand. So for example, there's a whole body of human knowledge um, which takes two to three years minimum to acquire. You can't just learn it. Yeah, it's, it's knowledge in your fingertips or heuristics. So I think there's a lot being talked about here and people aren't going back and remember some of the similar mistakes. So I think the real thing on the economy is, is not using experience as mediation instead of money or skills or whatever. The real issue and the one thing I'm interested in at the moment is, is how gifting works. Because I, I did a lot of work on this in Aboriginal communities in Australia back in the 70s. Uh, gifting in Indigenous communities is an entry fee, it's not an exchange. So if you gift, you're part of the community, the community looks after you. If you don't gift, you're excluded. No? And, the, and the gift isn't, as I say, an equal exchange. Now, there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't give free at the point of entry healthcare, education, and social services everywhere in the world. It's just we choose not to, we ration it with money. Yeah, indigenous communities don't ration things with, with a means of exchange, they have a gifting culture. And to me, I think that's one of the areas we've got to start to look at, all right, in terms of the next generation economy. And I think COVID is driving that faster because the breakdown in traditional economic discipline, the increasing dependency of local communities on support, um, we're starting to see some of those changes. I mean, neoliberalism was, was a bad idea in the first place and thank God is dead, but I really don't want it to be replaced with fascism, which still seems like the most likely alternative at the moment. Yeah? So I think we need to start to look at, look at these sort of different things. And we also need to think about the competence because I and mean, one of the, the sense making frameworks I created, I've only gone through a few of them in, in four, four lectures, all right, is called ASHEN, which starts, stands for Artifact Skills, Heuristics, Experience, and Natural Talent. And it's a mechanism for knowledge mapping. So when somebody makes a decision, you say, you cluster those decisions, and you say, when you made that decision, what artifacts did you use? Yeah, Ar artifacts comes from artes and facto, something man made. Yeah, what skills were necessary, and a skill is something you can train somebody to do and know whether they've got it or not. Yeah, what heuristics are present, because heuristics are a key method by which experts make decisions. What experience is necessary, and what natural talent is there. Yeah, and what we basically argue with that is all five of those things come into play in different balances in different contexts. So the danger is you start to say, well, we're not in this economy, we're not in economy X, we're in economy Y. Yeah, you know, it's like BPR, we're no longer vertically focused, we're horizontally focused. You have these constant switches from one thing to another and don't realize that all, all things have validity within different contexts, within different boundaries. Yeah, so it's, it's this desire to always create the new thing. And you, you see it a lot. Now, I get really angry with it on social media. Well, I don't get angry, I just get irritated, and that's always dangerous, right? Yeah, somebody puts up two columns, and on the left are terrible evil things, and on the right are terrible uh, you know, things that I'm selling, which by definition are not evil. And I always look at them, and I want to draw it, you know, kind of like, well, actually, most of the stuff on the left, is, there's nothing wrong with it in some contexts. Yeah? And a lot of the stuff on the right would be a bad idea. So we need to get much more sophisticated about the way we talk about this. And we also need to create economies which are not dependent on skills or experience. If you want to have a civilization, you've got to have jobs for people who don't have skills and experience. Yeah, and then people just aren't thinking about that. I mean, it's quite, it's, I mean, I don't know where it's still the case. I always used to like driving from um, Washington State down to Portland. Um, because I, I didn't have to fill up the gas anymore. Because you're not allowed to get out of your car and fill up the gas, they do it for you. So they've got effectively an employment tax. You know, there's people who have to be employed to fill up your tank. All right? and, and I'm not saying that should be a universal, but they're not just letting automation replace all the jobs for people. Because then you get a terrible underclass and you don't have to read much science fiction to know the consequences of that kind of thing. I think that's a really good uh, segue into the other question. Um, Dave, are you familiar with the game B space, game B? 
No, I'm, I'm not a game player. And I'm, I think it all, it all got too difficult after Space Invaders, to be honest. So, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll see. So, and I will make a general yeah. comment, though. That, that, I mean, we've seen this in a lot of our work. And we've seen it in some of the military game players. Yeah, most games involve understanding the rules. And life isn't like that. So you need to be very careful on it. I mean, we, we have a game system we use called Anthro Simulation, which is set up so that people can't succeed, run by human games masters. And the rules are changed by the games masters as they go through to make sure people fail. Well, you know, it's interesting because when you were talking about the experience economy, well, I, I interpret it a completely different way, and I'm not sure how the person who asked the question uh, meant it. When I heard experience economy, I heard, um, as opposed to things like, um, I can buy this mug, I can buy an experience of like watching a Netflix show or experience of going to Disney World or something like that, experience having to be something that's immaterial, something that's um, attracting. Okay, no, right, we, we call that the service economy. Mm -hmm. So I may be using different language there. Mm -hmm. um, you still have to have something which you're producing. Yeah, there has to be some heart on the economy. The, the huge weakness of the British economy at the moment is we're entirely reliant on financial services and we're about to lose them. Yeah, we've got no primary manufacturing. But I mean, the point still stand, all right? There is, there, is, there is not one right way of doing things. There are multiple right ways of doing things in different contexts. Okay, uh, Andy, you have a question? Hi, I wanted to ask about the um, domains. Let me pull back and see if I can. So um, if the competencies change um, as valued by our society with time, I want to know if there's some sub-competencies that uh, we can define that will change the apex predator curve, either make it deeper, shift it to the left or right. So let me give an example. So US healthcare delivery um, mm. used to, the competency used to be, uh, let's say relationship or quality, and now it's convenience. Um, so a cultural change has happened. Is there a way to um, generalize that to other domains? I think it's an important point. I mean, I, I'm meeting up with three doctors I go walking with tomorrow. I've been on my own this week, but now I'm with them for the weekend. And, and just as advice, never go walking with three doctors. If anything goes wrong with you, they'll spend all their time arguing about it while you die, all right? Um, one doctor is a good idea. But one of the things they all say is they don't want to be operated on by anybody under 50. Because what happened to medical training in the UK at uh, that equivalent point is it went from people effectively being trained as teams with people they know where people covered for your mistakes and looked after you and you gradually gained experience into people having designated qualifications and being allocated to teams automatically either were treated as a commodity yeah rather than as people so that's leading to a breakdown in the healthcare sector in the US and the UK right which relates to the care issue now, you've got various ways that that can go. One is we could go to an entirely faith healing alternative. And you can see some of that, you know, why, why don't you swallow some bleach and you won't get COVID. Right? And that sort of thing is growing. Um, you could start to reintroduce primary care with people who are based in communities and want to work with communities. But that itself is difficult. We're doing work at the moment on conflict in maternity services where the professionals would you know ideally want all women put into hospital at six months and put into a bed and you know basically manage to produce the perfect baby and can't understand why women don't like this idea and want to stay within their communities and get care at a local level yeah and that sort of commodification and that failure to appreciate it yeah is part of the problem right so i think some of the strategies you've got to do is we've got to create and this comes into complexity theory. Um, you can't tackle a dominant attractor. If you've got a dominant negative attractor, if you attack it directly, you'll make it worse. That's the mistake liberals are making in criticizing Trump. 
you, know, you, you, you don't tackle those things directly. You tackle it by making alternative attractors stronger so they take energy away from the negative attractor. So I think the secret to making the change is the sm sort of small parallel experiments we talked about on Kinevin, but also some of the apparatic techniques. Um, and I only went into those briefly, but the whole point about apparatic techniques is, is to create irresolvable paradoxes or contradictions so people are forced to act and think differently. Yeah, uh, you can't flip into the norm. But I think you raised a really important point and we've got to try and do more of it. Um, and the other thing I think is, and this partly comes actually into the experience economy per your question, going back to that a bit. Um, the more you increase the personalization of a product, the less it's a commodity. Yeah, and and that, that's important to realize. And it's been, I mean, we've been going through hell lately on legal fronts and God knows what else. And one of the things which I've learned from that is loyalty matters. Um, and it's amazing how loyal people are if you've treated them with respect and you've actually done things and all that sort of thing. And I think the, the loyalty element and that there's community limitations on this. Yeah. The part of the problem we've got with politics is we're too far removed from the people we elect. Right? Um, democracy actually evolved for a system where you knew who your representative was to the parliament or the Congress. It didn't resolve for a system where you were just one of 150 or 200,000 and you had no idea who you were voting for. And I'm actually blogging about this at the moment. Right? Um, so I think one of the key things we've got to do in this Generally, I'm starting a series of blogs on the subject of intimacy, um, which is not me getting to be a dirty old man or anything like that, I hasten to add, but it's saying you need to increase intimacy um, within service provision with commodities, because actually that's how you create differentiation and loyalty. Is there a way to scale loyalty? Yeah, I think there is, but I think you scale it by nodal networks. I mean, we, Valdis Krebs and I are doing an exploratory in the new year, if you know Valdis Krebs. Okay, he's the best person I know in the world on network analysis. So one of the things we're going to be exploring at that is what type of nodal networks um, create the highest level of rapid promulgation of imitative behavior, which is beneficial. Yeah, I mean, the, the key thing you've got to realize is that behavior evolves, it can't be designed. This is a big mistake of behavioral economists. You know, they're, they're thinking they can design behavior and they, they had a Hawthorne effect at the start because it was novel to get a letter saying that your neighbor had paid their tax and you hadn't, right? Um, but it's no longer novel, so it's past the Hawthorne stage and it, it's manipulative. Uh, Dave, do you have a couple of minutes, maybe 10 to 15 minutes extra? Yeah, sure. I'm fine. Okay, perfect. Thank you for humoring us again and again. Um, I believe on, on the point of medical care, I, th I believe um, Dan, Dan, you had a question, a follow-up question for that uh, point you just made. Dan Feldman. Um, what was, I'm sorry, what was the question? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You, you, you asked about the Bert Zorg method. Uh, oh, the Bert Zorg. I, I think uh, you were talking about, Dave, I think you were talking about um, uh, intimacy and primary care, spreading out primary care. And I was wondering if the, uh, I know you're not a fan of the Reinventing Organizations book, as I'm not, uh, I'm not either. But uh, the, cons the, the idea that, that uh, the Bert Zorg organization where, uh, that was highlighted in that book where the, uh, I guess the members of this organization meet the patients directly and they're kind of self-managed or self-organized. And I was wondering if you had any comments on that. I, th I think it suffers from all the cases in that book that he only picks the parts of the cases which actually support his religious beliefs. And that, that's the problem with everything in the crops, yeah? He's got an ideology and he's highly selective in what he presents. Um, and that's been around for some time and hasn't scaled, yeah? And I think the trouble is you can lose these things very quickly. They build over years, yeah? Um, 
So the whole sort of concept of the primary care, the doctor who'd lived in a neighborhood whose father was your doctor before you or his mother was your doctor before you and knew everybody and knew the family, the total depersonalization of healthcare is, is now a problem, right? And it's not going to be solved by some behavioral training and some inspired leadership. It's going to be, have to be solved by far more systematic change yeah, in the way we do things. Yeah. And you know, part of that, I think, uh, I speak at the moment having, you know, I'm 66 and I'm walking 30 miles a day and climbing 4,000 feet a day. And meeting people in their 40s struggling to get up 200 meters to a popular tourist site. And we're not doing enough on, on health. Yeah, we're, we're doing too much on the sort of, you know, diagnose cure type cycle. Yeah, so we're not creating resilience in the population. And again, I think we've got to look at ways of scaling that. And I think it's got to be something which, at, and I think it's the key principle for complexity. When it emerges, we'll recognize it, but we can't design it up front. And the problem with all of the Lacrox types books, and there's many, is they're trying to design utopia. And that never works. Yeah? What you have to do is to change the constraints and see what works and then amplify the things which do and dampen the things which don't. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, Anjan, Anjan also. I'll give you an example on that, actually, I remember. So, go on, go on. I was just going to tell another story, so ask another question, go for it. No, no, please, please go ahead, please. Uh, it was an example, I, I had to give a lecture to um, a thing called Spring Sunningdale, which is every year all of the, um, the heads of you know, the civil service heads and all the heads of British industry get together for three days off site. So it's Chatham House rules. Yeah? And it was rather amusing because I got invited to speak and I got the best slot, which is the after dinner slot, because then you get to have a meal with the guys and stay around and get drunk with them, right? And which is a lot better than just having a 20 minute presentation during the day. And I still remember I told the I IBM general manager for Britain, I've been invited and I got this vicious email back saying, why have you used it an invitation intended for somebody more senior than you? Um, at which point, you know, the cabinet office had to explain I've been invited despite the fact I worked for IBM, not because I had. And then they sent me a slide set and wanted to rehearse me and what they wanted me to say and they had to have another conversation with the cabinet office. But either way, I got there and I was doing a basic complexity Kinevin type thing um, because we'd, we used extensively on well, a whole bunch of stuff on foreign policy and things like that. So I was presenting it. Um, and just before I started, the permanent secretary for health ran up to me and said, you can't use the matron example. And I said, why can't I use the matron example? And he said, because, you know, I'll come back to that in a minute. All right. And the matron example was very simple. I use it a lot in complexity. So it used to be, and it was all girls in those days, young girls left school became a nurse, lived in a nursing hospital, you know, got their qualifications, gradually came up the rank, and throughout this period, they were terrified of this figure called the matron, who was the most senior nurse. And then one day they discovered they were the matron. And the matron picked up on all the pieces the other parts of the system didn't deal with. And if you were a junior doctor, technically you could tell the matron what to do, but God help you if you tried. You know, it was like the young lieutenant trying to say something to a staff sergeant. Yeah, it was the same sort of result. Um, now, it's interesting because when they allowed men to become nurses, it's quite interesting. Now, the dominant number of nurse managers are male, even though the dominant number of nurses are female, and that should tell us something. But what also happened is they got rid of matrons because they said there were a super surplus level of management. Nobody could see what they did. Yeah. Now, the reality is they held the system together like a sergeant, you know, like the regimental sergeant major, the staff sergeant, all these sort of people did. They didn't get rid of them in Northern Ireland, which was interesting. Yeah. Um, and the reason they didn't get rid of them in Northern Ireland is they were holding the system together because you had young nurses dealing with their boyfriend from school coming in with his knee shot off as a punishment killing. All right. So, I mean, the, the, uh, read the story of Marta Day. It's written by one of the nurses there, which is a good friend of mine. It's been brilliant, you know, what they had to put up with in Belfast. So they didn't get rid of it then. So I always use this as an example of an evolved role that you get rid of at your peril. 
and say that the guy in charge of health said you can't use the example and i said well you know I, i've been told to do it by defense because they've kept their sergeants and you got rid of their matrons and i'm more scared of defense than i am of you so i'm going to use it anyway and i never get he said well you can't use it because we're bringing back matrons i said oh great you've got a 30-year process have you he said oh no we've got a two-week training course and we're giving them a career route to become doctors and i used the example he just hadn't understood it um, stable, stabilizing elements of social systems take decades to evolve. They can't just be designed and put in place instantly. And that's something we've got to start to understand in politics and everything else. Yeah, that, that's a real challenge for evaluating new programs or programs that's, yeah. Well, it's a desire uh, for a quick hit. I mean, that's not a Lacroix book sells because it, it sounds wonderful and everybody knows they won't have to do it. That's perfect for most executives. Buy a program which you know, is full of platitudes, say you're gonna do it and just carry on as normal. Most of Agile is like that. So uh, maybe we have time for a couple more, two more questions. Uh, Anja and always has a lot of very good questions. So Anja, I'll let you ask one of your questions. Anja? Uh, we can't hear you for some reason. Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dave, I noticed you use a fair number of um, natural analogies um, to biology, to nature. And I'm curious, do you think they're just analogies or is there a chance um, it's something more? It's no, actually. I think it's, something, I think it's something more, but I don't want to get new age fluffy bunny about this, right? Um, but we, I mean, part of the problem is Northern Europe and Northern America has got thoroughly into Cartesian dualism, the belief that the mind is separate from the body. And part of the problem we got with what I call the adoption of faux Buddhism in the States is it furthers that distinction. It claims not to, but it actually furthers it. Yeah. Um, the reality is that consciousness is a distributed function of the body and the brain and its social connections. Andy Clark's work on this has shown that narrative structures in society are part of our extended consciousness. Um, so we are physical creatures. I mean, it, and you know, this whole concept of the singularity, I mean, if you believe in the singularity, your brain is probably ossified to the point where for you it may be possible. Yeah, you know, human consciousness is not like that. It's much more distributed. We know that, for example, pheromone traces have a significant pickup in humans in determining trust, which is a problem with virtual communication. So we are physical creatures in a physical world. Um, and the distinction, the separation of us from that physical world is behind things like global warming, all sorts of other things. Yeah. I spend a lot of my time working with indigenous communities. They don't make that separation. Now you can't adopt their practices intact, but you can learn from that. Yeah. And that's where I was coming on to the concept of gifting. The other thing it's worth reading, and I know in a Catholic school I shouldn't be doing this, but the Pope's encyclical on the environment called La Doughty Say should be read because he's a chemist. Uh, we're actually doing some work on this at the moment. And if you look at a lot of modern religious practice, it's actually about reintegrating us with the physical world. Yeah, as that sort of sense of something other. Uh, the technical term for this is numinous, which we're running projects on at the moment. The sense that there's something more than you. So I think that's one aspect of it. The other is that chemicals play far more part in our decision making than we like to think. So the ecological metaphors do come across as physical descriptions, not as metaphors. They're not deterministic though, that's the difference. They're deterministic in termites nests, but they're not deterministic in humans. They're dispositional. Very interesting. <clears throat> so maybe we'll have time for one more question. Um, sorry, Deef, I took so long to ask your question. Deef, are you still here? Do you um, want to ask your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, well, it's tough to keep up with all their jargon and all the different models, but the question I uh, sort of keyed in when you described asymmetric, asymmetric warfare, how you the terrorists mm. just wear down 
the defenses. If could you use that same analogy to sort of say how the inform age, information age, and technology twenty four seven news social media has sort of flooded the masses with too much information to process. Yeah. So there we can't make the decisions. So um, maybe whoever the apex predators are sort of taking advantage of this landscape of just the masses just can't navigate the sort of confusing flooded mass. And uh, if I gave a lecture on that in DC just before last November when I was over. Yeah. But what, what you do, the whole point about this, if you flood people with too much information, they start to delegate decision making. And the minute people delegate decision making, the people, you know, that they'll just go. I mean, the way I said it once, which I still stand by, is everybody used to trust experts from the 40s onwards. And if you look at the news, then you have consideration. It's once per day. Everybody watches it. You get journalism. Now we've got information saturation and people can't cope. So they're trying populist for a change. Yeah. So I think that's that's one point. All right. The the sheer volume of information creates an asymmetric threat actually to our survival as a species or certainly as a humane species. And, and that's critical. Right. The other thing, sorry, I'm, I'm going to react a little bit to your use of the word jargon, all right, and quote Heidegger. Um, Heidegger famously said, man thinks he's the master of language, but language is the master of man. If you don't pay, change people's language, you don't change the way they think. Yes, uh, we have some really interesting other questions, but I think we should close it up here for now. Um, just to give you a preview of some of the things that people are thinking about, Dave, um, someone asked, can you talk more about your metaphysical views? And personally, I've been interested in your, in your religious views as well. So maybe sometime you can talk about that. Um, maybe I'll give you some, a little bit of time to talk about what you want to, uh, a brief introduction for next week or anything else you want to close off with. Um, okay, I, I wrote a blog recently where I confessed to being a Pelagian. I think Pelagianism is the heresy to adopt, so I recommend that. Right? And anything St. Augustine opposed is to be supported, because anybody who could write the bloody city of God, which I was forced to read, deserves to be punished. Right? Um, but Pelagian is called the British heresy. It's the belief that you have free will, and there's no original sin. And I think that's where we need to be at the moment. All right, all right. Okay, thank you, Dave. Thanks, everyone. I just want to make some announcements about uh, still a session that's coming up tonight. Um, the name of it is called God Bless the Broken Bones, and it's with William Ferraiolo. Ferraiolo, I hope I pronounced that correct. It's at 7.30 um, uh, tonight, 7.30 tonight. Also, if you're enjoying the store, um, I would invite you to, um, if you feel called, to give a gift to the store on Patreon. And I just posted the link in the chat. Um, but yeah, well, thank you, Dave, and thank you everyone for the amazing questions. And um, I hope to see everyone back here again. I think on well soon. It's in the uh, on the event page, so I'll next see you week. back next week. Okay, perfect. Thank you, everyone. Take it easy. Uh, thank you so.